Well, good morning, and thanks uh, very much for joining us, or afternoon, evening, wherever it is that you are. Um, so I'm Brett Waters, and we, for the next 45 minutes or so, we'll be discussing um, high-resolution seed financing for startups. So um, the first thing I want to do is ask you to guys ask you guys to go to the chat box and enter uh, where you're calling from, where you, where you are joining us from this morning, because um, it'd be great to know uh, where you all are as we have this live stream discussion. So it's a um, it's a pretty interesting time right now. There's a lot going on. Uh, Crunchbase says over three hundred billion dollars in funding went into startups in 2021. Um, and over 13 billion of that was seed financing, which is a 35% increase over the previous year. Um, and by all appearances, 2022 will be even bigger. So, um, so it's a very interesting time uh, right now. So most of the discussion we're going to have today is going to be about kind of seed finance, the, the seed finance ecosystem that flows into the traditional venture capital ecosystem. But there are a lot of great ways to finance a startup in 2022. Um, and in fact, I've written a little uh, e-booklet on this topic. We've written a little e-booklet on all the great ways to finance a startup, uh, not just venture capital and traditional seed capital, but uh, SBIR grants and revenue share and a whole bunch of other things. If you'd like a copy of that, um, just go to fourthly.com and you can download your free copy of that booklet. So we've got a terrific um, panel of experts um, here to join us uh, this morning. Um, and I'd like to start by uh, introducing uh, Danielle. So Danielle, welcome. Hi, Brett. Thanks uh, for having me. And hi, everyone out there joining the show today. So um, Danielle, uh, where are you this, this morning? And give us a little brief background on yourself. Yeah, so um, I'm streaming from a place called Santa Rosa, California, kind of north of San Francisco. Um, and I'm part of a fund called WVV. Um, we're a $100 million fund uh, backed by four corporates, as you see on the screen. Um, prior to that, um, I built and ran an accelerator called Alchemist, which was the leading um, B2B accelerator um, in the country. Um, and in that role, I worked with and invested in over 400 early stage B2B startups. Um, so I've seen a thing or two from, from all sides of the coin. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for doing this, Danielle. Yeah. So uh, also joining us is, uh, is my partner in this production, uh, Louis Lowe. So Louis and I are, uh, are co-sponsoring today's discussion. Louis, welcome. Hopefully you can hear me just okay. Can hear you fine. So where are Fabulous. where are you and where are you? I, Tell us about yourself. I, Tell us about Foley. I, I'm in my home office, about uh, a half half a mile from Stanford campus, not far from uh, where Danielle used to run Alchemist. Uh, and uh, um, I try and uh, get into the office every day these days, Brett. But uh, somehow through the pandemic and the changing social mores, I seem to be getting on calls earlier in the morning, staying home and getting into the office uh, after a taco um, yeah. uh, sometime in the early afternoon. But uh, this is my home office and uh, I'm just delighted to be here. And, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to put this show together um, is just the world has changed uh, so, so yeah. fundamentally uh, in this time. And sometimes it happens and we don't really uh, take stock of it. And and so uh, sitting down over a taco a few weeks ago, Brett and I realized that you know, the, the way that startups are raising uh, seed and pre-seed capital has, has just gone into turbocharged. And, and I re recalled this, uh, this term, high resolution fundraising uh, for startups, and, and uh, we're going to explore it today. And I'm just delighted. Um, I'm at Foley and Lardner. We are uh, uh, an AMLAW 50 uh, law firm. Uh, I, I co-lead a team of 20 lawyers that are exclusively focused on startups and, and seed stage investors. And uh, we love what we do and we have fun doing it. Thank you so much for doing awesome. this with me, Brett, and for coming, Danielle. You bet. You bet. So uh, Louis and I have a favorite, uh, we share a favorite taco place in downtown Palo Alto. So whenever <laughs> Whenever Louis and I have a big important deal to discuss, we always do it over tacos at Sancho's Taqueria. So, also joining us is uh, is Chris Clark. Um, Chris, tell us where you are today. <laughs> I'm laughing because I happen to know I happen to know where he is right now, uh, and also give us a little bit of background on yourself, Chris. Yeah, great to be here. 
Um, I'm currently in Kitzbühel, Austria, um, on a ski trip, but I live in San Francisco, where I spend most of my time. Um, I started Locale. Uh, Locale is a like a long-range delivery marketplace that delivers the best food from local restaurants and bakeries for up to up to hours away, like up to 100 miles away. So you kind of think of us as like a, a mid to long-range delivery service. If you think about the space, there's DoorDash, Uber Eats, all those players that deliver up to 15 miles away. And then there's shipping like Gold Belly that delivers, you know, across the country for crazy delivery fees. And we're right in the middle between those two, which is funny enough where most of like these high end restaurants and bakeries customers actually live, which is in, like the 10 to 100 mile range. So we're kind of serving this market that currently doesn't have any way to reach those customers. Um, one more background about me. I graduated from school about a year and a half ago. I uh, did investment making for a year after that. Um, and then I've been full time at Locale for about eight months now. That started a year and a half ago. Awesome. And so, Chris, let's start the discussion with you because you are the one who most recently amongst the four of us most recently raised some seed capital. (laughs) So tell us tell us kind of how that process went, um, what methodology you used like Mm -hmm. that. How'd you find it? Yeah, so we raised we closed our seed round about seven months ago, six or seven months ago. So the market was still like really, really hot. we had an interesting process. Basically, we went through Y Combinator, and so they kind of like really babied us through the fundraising process. Um, like to be honest, going into it, like there's a lot of like it was our first, you know, fundraising round with real venture capitalists, like not just friends and family. So there's a lot of like mm-hmm. imposter syndrome in the beginning, like feeling like I don't know what I'm doing, or, like what even is the imposter I mean, syndrome? Space, like, yeah, yeah. You just you've never you've read about it so many times, but actually doing it and like understanding what you like to raise is a whole different process. Um, so like through their help, through Brett's help, with a lot of other advisors, just kind of try to get a feel for how you kind of run the process um, and how to you know take control of it. I think a lot of this is like a power dynamic um, and learning that it's way more of an art than a science. Like I think coming from investing <laughs> banking, I felt like I, I ran like mm-hmm. all these like models of like okay, what what should our valuation be? Like I, I can run like DCFs, like all these crazy things. And like, at the end of the day, it's just like a conversation and like how well you tell a narrative, especially when you don't really have crazy metrics yet. Um, but with that being said, like the process was a lot easier than I expected, especially in this market. Like there wasn't a lot of diligence. Like our biggest investor didn't really do any diligence. It was like probably an hour long of conversation for you know, Interesting. a crazy concept for me. Like at the time, and still kind right. of is. Um, but I mean, that being said, it was it was way less of a daunting process than expected. But like, have to be aware that I did help like the benefit of like Y Combinator and great advisors kind of like helping us. Yeah. So I think that to me, the kind of the highlight in that whole paragraph is that coming from an investment banking background, you thought it was about doing spreadsheets and coming up with evaluation based on discounted cash flows. And in fact, it really came down to telling the narrative, being good at telling the story, telling a crisp, clear and compelling story. Yeah. I think that's that's a really important uh, kind of highlight within what you just said. So, Chris, you did um, you did a friends and family round. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then a more formal um, seed round after that. Is mm-hmm. that what you said? Yeah. So and we're, and we're, was, was on convertible debt, and then the seed was on the safe. Got it. So you did convertible notes first, and then you did safes. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Got it. And and the total there was how much money? Total was around two and a half million. Two and a half, two and a half million. Great. Okay. Thanks. Congratulations, um, Chris. That's awesome. Thanks. Appreciate that. So, Louis, um, you know, you, you you and I have both been around Silicon Valley for a while. We've seen different um, phases, different eras. So what do you see going on right now, especially with regard to seed financing? What do you see going on right now that's different from previous eras? Um, well, I'm, I'm seeing lots of funds like Danielle's uh, at WVV that, that are coming together uh, with various partners in the ecosystem, and Danielle can talk more about um, WVV, which is, is a really exciting fund, um, but who are really focused on seed stage companies. And um, you've also got um, operators coming together in what, what are called operator collectives. So these are um, successful mid-career executives who may have had a, a liquidity event or have, have done well and who are looking to be exposed to startups and, and the startup ecosystem. And so they're pooling together into a fund uh, and investing uh, through that. Um, AngelList 
and uh, other platforms have made it easy for people to band together informally um, it, on a deal by deal basis and what we call SPVs to, to come together and invest. So you have this pool of uh, capital that's, that's really looking at this sector, which is early stage. Um, and by early stage, I mean pre-revenue companies. Um, meanwhile, there's been this ecosystem uh, that's developed of accelerators um, and I have a video blog on, on Y Combinator and Alchemist and others, and it's harder to get into Y Combinator than it is to Harvard Business School. So high five to you, Chris. Um, and and uh, so these folks are really preparing the startups, um, putting them through the boot camp. And I'd love to hear your feedback, Chris, on what you learned in, in YC. But um, I think that they're really doing a great job of teaching startups uh, how to go from zero to one. And, and there's a pool of capital out there that, that wants to get in there. Now, um, it, it used to be that you'd invest uh, as a seed stage investor with a convertible note and you'd be negotiating a cap and a discount and a maturity date. And 10 years ago, uh, once again, our friends at Y Combinator came up with a simple agreement for future equity. It's neither equity nor debt. It's a, it's a promise to convert uh, at, at a future date. Um, the other uh, accelerators like 500 Global, uh, formerly known as 500 Startups, has developed something called the KISS, a similar thing, and, and others have, have, have come up with their own pieces of paper. And the novelty here is it doesn't have a maturity date, as it just takes time for startups to get to the right place, and oftentimes the maturity date was a company killer. And so um, you've got now got um, a pool of capital, an instrument, and um, players set up around the ecosystem that are really helping develop this new age of, of early stage st startups uh, get off the ground leanly without raising tons of money. Um, I've talked to Long Brett in passion about this, um, and, and uh, I, I think the, the really the magic has been in the last two years just how quickly they've been able to raise the capital just by going on Zoom and, and getting connected to, to people in these um, 15 uh, minute sessions where people can decide, am I in or am I out? And I know we're going to talk more about that. Yeah. So I was thinking as you're talking, Louis, I was thinking about how um, 10 and 12 years ago, I raised uh, a seed round for a startup. We structured it as convertible notes because that was how it was done then because the safe, the safe thing didn't exist at the time. Um, and as you said, Louis, there kind of were, th there were three things to negotiate with the convertible well, no, one was the maturity date. So when would the notes come due? Second is the um, is the conversion valuation, um, typically called a value cap, valuation cap. And the third is the discount. So um, so basically a standard convertible note was your rich uncle saying to you, I'll give you some money so you can get your startup going. Um, and let's just call it debt for now. And then two years from now, when you raise a big venture capital round, I will agree to convert this money that I've given you. I'll agree to convert it to equity at whatever valuation you and the future VC agree upon. Uh, and I want a little bit of a discount. I want a slightly better deal than the VCs got. So that was how a convertible was structured. Um, and the what happened was that as valuations went crazy and suddenly people were getting these ridiculously high valuations in their venture round. The people who had a convertible node and just simply agreed that it would convert at whatever future valuation the VCs came up with, uh, were suddenly finding that they had a whole lot less of the company than they thought, that they put 100 grand in at the seed stage. They thought to themselves, oh, it'll be worth probably, you know, 5% of the company, 10% of the company when it's all said and done. Um, and then two years later, the company goes out and raises a, a Series A equity round at you know, at a hundred million dollar valuation, and suddenly that hundred grand that I put in early, you know, is worth one percent of the company or less, a half percent of the company, and I'm like, well, how is that fair? That I, I was the first money in, I took the risk, and now you're telling me I own one half of one percent of the company, um, and so then this notion emerged of valuation caps, which said that I'll accept whatever future valuation is established, uh, but no higher than X. <laughs> I want to know that my hundred grand in will be worth at least this much. Um, and I was thinking, Louise, you were talking about um, my experience 12 years ago with this was we raised a convertible note round and the two year maturity date came and went, 
we had not yet raised a uh, an equity round. And it wasn't clear from the way the notes were written. It wasn't clear what happened. <laughs> it right. just said the maturity date, maturity date was, you know, this date. Uh, but we got to that date and we had neither raised the venture round nor were we in any position to pay the notes back. Um, and so fortunately for me, I was able to uh, have a discussion with all the seed investors and say to them, hey, tell you what, why don't we extend these notes? Um, and everybody was agreeable to it. But it was definitely a lesson in the, in the fact that you, one needs to think through all the different contingencies and make sure that it's written such that there's clarity on what happens um, if certain uh, triggers happen or don't happen. That's a really so, good point. And yeah. fast forward to the present, uh, where you have all of these funds investing in, in seed, knowing that it's going to be outstanding for a long time, much longer than six months, nine months, a year, two years. And, right. and also the problem of the valuation cap doesn't necessarily solve whether they get a seat at the table at the A round. And so there, what, right. there's been the development of the, of the, the safe side letter, um, which um, is posted on the YC website as the pro rata side letter, which has become the super pro rata side letter. And um, you know, sometimes the kitchen sink side letter uh, which provides for information rights so that you know the, the investor can be getting uh, you know quarterly financials and know what what how to book it in their own uh, reports to their limited partners as to what it's worth uh, making sure that the startup has in place um, policies about social issues that matter uh, today like anti-discrimination uh, policies and procedures uh, and and uh, uh, obviously pro rata rights and other things that matter and so I'm finding that in these high resolution uh, fundraising processes is, is that we've got a, a moving side letter and, and you try and keep things as uniform as you can. So things move quickly, but oftentimes you're dealing with investors that have unique issues. Um, you know, uh, Gangels has a has a really interesting um, side letter process that, you know, I think is worthy of some uh, discussion today or on another webinar about, you know, what they think companies should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so really series A has become series seed and series seed has, has become, you know, pre seed and, right. um, it, these are exciting right. times. All right. So I want to get back to the high resolution thing, Louis, but first I want to bring Danielle into this. So Danielle, you spent seven years running, uh, Alchemist, the, the leading, uh, B2B startup accelerator program. And so in that role, you were kind of both an investor and a, um, and a founder advocate in the sense that you were making investment decisions along with the admissions process. Mm -hmm. And then you were helping, you were helping founders in their fundraising process after, after the program. Um, and now of course you're, you know, now you're with a fund on the investing side. So what have you seen, you know, in, kind of in those seven years <laughs> from when you started mm -hmm. at Alchemist to today, uh, or eight, eight or nine years, I guess, total, um, you know, how, how have you seen things change? And what's it? What's the environment like today in your in your mind? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a ton of changes that have happened in, in that time. I mean, you guys have already talked about the changes from convertible notes to adding in Kiss to adding in Safe to adding in whatever new Safe YC is talking about today. Like, um, and then not only that, you've seen funds just continue to raise more and more money. And then a bunch of smaller funds just pop up. So everyone's becoming a fund manager now. Um, so there's just more capital than ever before. Um, and honestly, not, you know, at least for the last couple of years, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a heck of a time for, for founders to, uh, to raise in this environment. Um, because there's so much money, it, it, you know, you, you need to, it, it, if you don't raise money, in, in this environment, um, it it begs the question, why not? Uh, just because there's so much money to, to be had out there. Um, and so, and, and then if you're raising, you know, how much are you raising? And then at what valuation? Um, honestly, there's, because of, of the last couple of years, I mean, founders have always tried to get more on the valuation side just because it, it, it behooves them to do so um, and what they're willing to get away with. But what, what the separation was, was who could get away with, you know, the most valuation in, in the process. And that kind of, you know, separated the, the super founders from, 
from everyone else, right? If you were able to kind of go in and be like, well, we don't have much, but we have this awesome team and vision. Um, and, you know, I want, I want a $20 million valuation for a seed round. Like those were, those were the super special ones. Um, if they were able to pull it off now, that was kind of, uh, table stakes for, for the last year. If you're raising a seed round, um, we have heard some, some pretty ridiculous, uh, amounts being raised, of uh, valuations, um, for nothing, for, for no product, for not being launched for, you know, um, if you were a serial entrepreneur, like y you could get whatever you wanted, um, you know, for, for not even having started. Um, and, and then depending on what sector you were in, you're in fintech, crazy. Uh, you know, um, healthcare, for once everyone was throwing money in healthcare, which was which was great to see. Um, you know, it, was, I, it almost felt like throwing darts at the board um, for the last, <laughs> you know, two years. Everyone was trying like, we don't really understand healthcare and honestly, no one really does. It's, it's a beast to, to kind of pull apart, but um, you know, it, people made a, hundreds hundreds of bets um thousands of bets in the last couple of years on on different places in healthcare um which is so you know um we'll we'll see how that all plays out but um now you know and and a lot of you i'm sure have been paying attention to the stock markets um you know we we're seeing a kind of hesitation now um which we haven't really seen since the beginning of the pandemic so we've you know Venture in itself has has been very, very steady. Um, it's probably one of the most consistent things uh, <laughs> over the last the last 10 years. Um, and everyone has seen the the rapid increase. In, and Brett, you, you mentioned some numbers. Um, you know, the, those numbers were astronomical last year. Um, right now, we're in a we're in a hesitation um, to see where uh, where that goes. Does it actually come back down or do we keep just, you know, blown last year's numbers out the water? Um, so it's, it's I'm going to disagree with you, Danielle, for fun. Uh, okay, good. Cause I agree with you that, that we are seeing some hesitation, but that's at the later stage. If you're a series C company and you haven't really hit the benchmarks, um, you know, maybe last year it didn't matter and you'd still get 20 X. Uh, your ARR in a new round, but I, I'm seeing that in the seed and pre-seed stages. So this is we're talking uh, companies that are just coming together, just coming out of YC. That it is still gangbusters. Okay. Um, we recently closed a transaction, and it was in fintech, where there was so much demand that we 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 didn't know how to separate it all out, and we didn't want to take all the money. So we said, you're gonna, and you know, you you've got to put 50% of your check in this safe, capped it here. And then the other 50% is in another safe that's uncapped. Oh, um, yeah. So yeah, NYC now the, has an uncapped uh, safe as part of their, you know, part of their thing. So, um, yeah. uh, but when did that happen? Is this as of this week or was that of a week or two ago? Um, not this week. It, it came together over time and it closed uh, a, maybe two and a half weeks ago. Yeah. So I, the hesitation is actually, I think within the last week, I've been starting to hear funds and seed, um, you know, especially seed where they're just like, we're just going to see. Um, but again, like the last time I heard this was March or April of last year. Mm -hmm. And that lasted for a cool three weeks <laughs> before, before people were like, well, this is the new, the new normal. So here we go again, you know, and, and, and off to the races. So, um, that's, I, I did, I did, you know, some founders, I think got their, their big rounds closed just in time. Um, mm -hmm. but it'll, I think it'll be interesting to see what the, the next week or two look like, uh, especially with, with the, the peak in, in COVID happening right now. I think, I think people are all just maybe taking a slight pause, but you know, come March, we might be having a different conversation and this would all be moot. <laughs> so, Louie, I want to pick up on, um, you just said that you handled a deal recently where investors were required to put part of the money in an uncapped safe and part of the money in a cap, in a cap safe. Yep. Um, and I think that's a good segue into the whole discussion of high resolution seed fundraising. That um, So the history on this term, as far as I'm aware, 
uh, is Paul Graham, the uh, co-founder of Y Combinator. He wrote an essay a few years ago called High Resolution Fundraising. Um, and for any of you in the audience, if you haven't read Paul Graham's essays, uh, he's probably the best writer in the world of startups. He's, uh, he's a terrific writer. Just go to paulgram.com. His website looks like it's stuck in 1992, uh, but uh, there's a lot of great stuff there. And in this essay, he, he kind of coins, as far as I know, coins this term, high resolution seed fundraising. And what he means is this, that um, traditional venture capital, so that's you know series A and beyond, has always been structured as equity. And it's always been structured such that everybody in the round, every investor in this round, has exactly the same terms um, and that there's a close date and once everybody's money is in then the deal closes and all the investors again have exactly the same terms and what Paul Graham says in this essay is that seed financing as it kind of organically became an ecosystem of its own it just simply followed the existing venture model of one set of terms for all the investors in this round and a close date and um, uh, and Paul points out that there really is no reason for that other than just the muscle memory of that's how it was done in the venture world. But that with safes, there really is no reason why you can't be giving slightly different terms to each investor um, and have different close dates that, you know, and that kind of allows you as a founder to um, do things like incent investors to get their money in early. You can say, if you get your money in by Monday, you'll get a valuation cap of X and you're safe. And if you don't get it in by Monday, you'll get a valuation ca uh, uh, cap of Y. Um, and, um, and so I think you're seeing more and more of this. Um, and um, Lou, you want to speak to that a little bit in terms of, you know, you, you kind of probably touch more deals than any of the rest of us by virtue of your, your role as a Silicon Valley attorney. Yeah, no, I, I, that's exactly right. The safe uh, on the YC website has a term in it that says, and we promise that there are no differing terms so that everybody's getting the same thing. And so to get around that, you'll have different classes of safe uh, existing or that you'll be negotiating different terms in a side letter that don't necessarily that aren't necessarily economic terms about the valuation cap or the things that are in the safe. They're just terms outside the safe that exist only in the side letter. It's become sort of like the investor rights agreement in a seed deal, uh, the side letter in a safe or a convertible note deal. Um, and, and I think you're absolutely right that um, founders are uh, raising capital from different pockets of, of, of investors. Um, so we talked about the, the new uh, seed fund. We talked about operator uh, collectives. I'm seeing uh, groups of high net worth individuals who like a, a particular sector, um, you know, trying to get in almost at the formation stage and investing as as founders. Um, and uh, so, so the terms are, are going to be different. I, I had another really interesting deal recently where a company that was in the enterprise software space was trying to get more adoption as well as capital. And so rather than go out and, and raise money from uh, seed investors like my good friend Ben Harrison, thanks for joining Ben. They Thank went out to, to developers only and said, we only want capital from developers. We want you to look at this product, use it and, and proliferate it around your engineering team. And, you know, we'll give, you know, $10,000 tickets to, you know, up to a hundred developers. And we, we did this over zoom in, in, uh, in, in a cocktail party or two. And I was amazed at how successful it was, not only at, in raising the capital, but uh, getting um, into companies' uh, development teams that they wouldn't otherwise. So um, high resolution, Brett, is is happening. Uh, it has changed since Paul Graham wrote that article is what I think should be a takeaway from yeah. this podcast. Yeah. So I want to bring Ben into the conversation. Ben, thanks for thanks for joining us. Ben, you want to briefly introduce yourself? Oops, he's gone. <laughs> okay, so we're, while we're waiting for uh, for Ben, uh, so Albert asks a question, uh, uh, Louis, how uh, how does this compare to a rolling round? Yeah, so a rolling round. A ro is rolling, rolling closes, I guess is how you say it, right? Yeah. Yeah, surely. So um, it's always been the case in, in venture deals that you'd, you'd, uh, you'd close, you'd have a round of, let's say, 10, You'd have a first closing of five, and then you'd have 90 days to go get the other five. 
And that's typically what we mean by a, a rolling closing. Um, what's different here is that the terms themselves uh, are, are not the same. The pools of capital may not be the same. And, and what, what people are trying to get out of the deal is, is not the same. So they're really different financings. Great. And then Matt, ben, ben, are you with us? Can you hear us? I am. Sorry. A lot of weirdness on my end. I lost all the audio. I couldn't hear it. So I had to log back. Yeah, no problem. All right. You want to you briefly introduce yourself, Ben? Sure. I'm Ben Naris, and I was an entrepreneur for 25 years, uh, culminating in starting one of the first e-commerce companies in 93, which I took public in 99. Then I moved to Silicon Valley, became one of the first seed investors in 2007. Been doing that for about 15 years and recently spun out of NEA to launch a fund called Tenacity Venture Capital, where we do everything before the Series A. Everything before the Series A. Great. Yeah. Pre-seed, seed, awesome. seed, incubation, acceleration. You know, fundamentally, uh, although valuations are all over the place right now, you know, we want to get in before, you know, I've gotten to know about 300 VCs. And so part of my job is to help my entrepreneurs understand what it takes to get to Series A viability and then take them to those Series A investors and make those introductions when they're ready for them, uh, which every once in a while people misunderstand what that means. Uh, and then <laughs> look at, I spent a lot of time looking at term sheets and talking through with founders you know, relevant to this conversation, sort of what's market and what's not and what certain things mean right. and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Great. So M Matt asked a question. I'm not sure I exactly follow, but maybe some of the panelists can help me out here. So Matt says, this might be a good point to talk about the elephant in the room regarding terms fuzziness to founders um, and Ryan Breslow's issues with Y Combinator implications. So um, I guess is that founders kind of being fuzzy on the terms? Well, I think they're um, conflating two points there because, you know, Y okay. Combinator originated the safe as an idea. Right. Um, right. 500 startups had something called, I forget what, but everybody had their own version of a safe. Kiss. Yeah. Kiss. Right, right, right. And then. Right, right. So before, was, before, you ki before you kiss, it's important to be safe. There you go. Well, <laughs> you know, if you want to sort of think about a safe for a second, its origin point. And this would sort of actually be counter to the first half of Matt's point, but I don't want to address the second half. Safes were created to basically eliminate the unfriendly to founder elements of convertible notes, right? Mm -hmm. So safe stands right. for, as I'm sure you said, simple agreement for future equity. And they basically are very founder friendly, too much so actually, in a lot of ways. Um, I like that. Mm -hmm. I prefer new equity uh, for a lot of reasons. The YC issues are legion but not related to safes you know yc comes in and says hey you know i haven't read their new doctor everybody's complaining about them it's like one we'll give you a couple of empty peanut shells in exchange for six percent of your company and access to our team uh by the way we're not going to mention that we're taking one thousand companies so good luck getting value out of that sorry to drag on them but give me a break. and mm -hmm. In addition to getting 6% of your company for literally the garbage lying on our floor in terms of some tiny amount of money, we also want super rider rights to shove more money in later on free agreed upon safe. So, you know, one of the challenges I've for every once in a while, I wouldn't say a lot as an investor, but particularly if people have done too many safes or too many notes, and this has nothing to do with YC, is that the founders might be too diluted uh, and that worries me. So as an example, I'm doing a round right now out of the UK where you know, the founders have raised, you know, will be their second institutional round, so it's a little novel for me, but the founders are already, there's two of them, they're sub 10%. And to be sub 10% on basically your pre-first institutional U.S. venture round is not good. So I'm having to go back and my company sheet say, hey, let's bump up the option pool, let's give some of that back to the founders, let's get these guys and gals right size, because I don't want to have a conversation later about, oh, woe is me, I've taken these self inflicted wounds and now I'm all diluted and I don't feel motivated, which, you know, by the way, remember that all these wounds are self-inflicted, forces money on you. It's not like they hijack the business in the middle of the night, shove money in and dilute you. You agree to take that money. So be careful. <laughs> with you know, like, let's not, right. let's be big people here and recognize that we are usually dealing with our own challenges, not the challenges of others. But yeah. sometimes early stage folks take too much and are too greedy. And, um, and I find that troublesome, you know, and, yep. and I want to fix it. Yep. And then Matt, Matt enters a kind of a follow up saying uh, there's so many permutations of safe terms that it's almost impossible to determine what is happening to founders. So that and this kind of gets to Louis thing about about the side letter and a side letter with a safe. You can put all kinds of wild ass shit. Yeah. But basic safes are very entrepreneur friendly. But here's the thing. I want to dispel an illusion here. 
and and Louis really good about this, so I'm not going to lump him in with this. But lawyers in general, like all forms of human beings, are lazy. And so when they see the opportunity to do a safe, it's almost no work for them and they get paid a little bit. Right. Yeah. And they will tell their entrepreneurs, hey, it's so early. Let's not bother to deal with all that other stuff. Let's just do a safe. Now, there's an old saying in the garment business, speed, quality, price. Choose any two. Safes mm -hmm. are speed and price, not quality. You're not dealing with any of the hard issues. You're going to have to give a valuation. You think you're not, but you're giving them a cap. So, you know, all you're doing is maximizing your valuation. You can't go higher than that. You can't go lower. So, as an example, and Louis was counsel on this deal, we did a deal where we agreed to the deal in December and funded in December. Their counsel wanted us to do a safe, and I was like, no, 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 let's just do an equity round. Let's just use NBCA open source box. We got it done in under a month. It cost very little. Their counsel charged 10 grand. You know, our counsel charged something similar. You know, like it was a little more expensive and they had to do a little more work to fill the diligence. But now they have a real round. They have a price round, clean up the cap table. And here's the thing. If I'm doing a round and I do an equity round. Uh -oh. He's gone. Um, not, he's back. OK, I'm going to be very open minded to treating you as well as possible. I was an entrepreneur for 25 years. I'm used to being an entrepreneur. I want my entrepreneurs to win. If my round is NVCA based and you go to raise a series A and the investor knows me and knows it's NVCA based, they're probably going to let whatever I agree to stick. If it's a safe, you're starting from scratch. That means, right. as an example, you're revesting all your shares, right? So you go in thinking, oh, I own this whole company. And it's like, nope, you got to revest it all over four years. Now you come to me and say, Ben, I've been working on this for a year. I'd like some of those shares. I'll say, sure, I'll transmit it. 25% up front and you can have the rest over three years, which means by the time you raise your Series A, you're best at 50%. I think there's a decent chance the uh, VCs let that stick. Without me, you're starting from zero, and at best, you're going to get 20 or 25%. So you'd be better off with your friendly seed investor. And I'm not going to tell you every uh, seed investor is an honorable, honest, and friendly person. So you got to be a little careful there. But if they are, and they're aligned with your interests, you know, they're going to give you, they're going to have more flexibility. If you want something that's out of market, I'm not going to love that. But if Louis tells me it's okay, look, it's me. I just have to decide. It's not my whole damn partnership and my back office legal team. You know, so take advantage of getting yourself established correctly and on optimal terms early. The NVCA stuff is cheap and easy. Um, I don't recommend the series seed docs because my counsel at NEA used to tell me there was a lot of holes in it. And so you don't want to do a document that later, here's how, here's how venture. You go into bid on a series hey, B. Hey, Go ahead. Ben, ben Melissa's, asking, Melissa's asking the name of your fund. Do you want to drop that real quick? Tenacity Venture Capital, which is Tenacity. Tenacity fund. Venture Capital. The only place right. it exists online because we get more deals than we need is uh, LinkedIn, Tenacity Venture Capital. But so like in venture, yeah. when I do a series B or C, once I've decided I want to do the deal, I don't care about who was in before me. I've learned that's a mistake. Um, but once I'm in, I ask who is the last funder and if it's somebody I believe is sort of tier one high quality, then I just say, I'm sure we'll be fine with their terms. Let me see their term sheet. And usually it's a rubber stamp. Yep, index it, fine. Um, but if you haven't established those terms, then literally everything has to be debated. And that means you're starting from scratch at the time. When are you going to have more time to waste on this? When you're doing your seed or when you're doing your A? I would argue earlier is better. So I'm a big right. fan of equity rounds for entrepreneurs, and I think it aligns everybody, and, and there's some ways you win. And it doesn't help me more than it helps you, except that it more firmly triggers the QSBS clock. That's pretty much the only way that I win, and it doesn't, it's no negative to you. So while we're nailing on safe, somebody uh, r r raised uh, Ryan Breslow's uh, tweet thread. I had to look this up uh, while Ben was talking, and, and Ryan Breslow, an entrepreneur, uh, did a very long tweet thread about how uh, YC is not worth it and how uh, it's it's a um, I don't want to use the wrong word. It is uh, pilfering uh, the cap table of a company at the level of 10 to 14 uh, percent right. and and really unfair and that uh, there needs to be a movement where entrepreneurs get away from it. It's been too long. Uh, this, um, you know, validation stamp and, and uh, he suggests that, in fact, it's 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 uh, it's the opposite of a validation stamp. Um, there's another really good question about um, whether from Dan Bork about um, whether it's more ethical to have an uncapped safe uh, with a static discount rather than uh, with a cap. And um, Dan, I think that's a really good question. And and I think 
the cap and the discount really go to different things, right? The discount is saying I get a better price than the other guy uh, that comes in later, whereas the 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 cap the the uncapped is incentivizing the the founder to go big and and get a high as high a valuation as possible, so that that she or he is not eating um, the, uh, the the dilution. Another point that was made somewhere here is that. Um, one of the reasons the convertible note is so tough to deal with is, is the uh, the discount. The interest rate is compounding, and the dilution level is is really tough. Um, same thing for some of these um, 30% discounted uh, safes. Uh, founders often don't realize uh, how much they're going to be left with uh, later on down the line, which, again, argues for, for Ben's point that a price round, you know what you get, and you're setting yourself up um, for success. Although I would say that, look, I'm a big believer in fairness, and I know that that's in some ways illusory. You know, fair is what you negotiate, but I'm going to be fair, and I want people to deal with me fairly, and if they don't, then I'm not doing business with them. So, you know, you have to be the hottest of the hot to get fun in that note. Why would I say it? Like, oh, oh, so I can take absolute risk of bankruptcy, but get no upside, except to pay whatever schmuck pays a year from now? Come on. Like, if you're not going to treat me as a partner, then let's just agree to not be in business together. I'm not saying I've never, actually, I had an entrepreneur who wanted to do an uncapped note. And I said, you know, dude, I just think you send the wrong message. It's just an incredibly arrogant statement. Um, just put a high valuation cap on it. And he did. Um, and, you know, it worked out fine. I mean, you want everybody fighting for you. And if, look, I haven't seen this. I mean, I'm not one of the people that's going to play this way. But if you have an uncapped note and, and the people are introducing you to VC, do you think they're in the background lobbying for the highest possible price? No, they're, they, you know, they're lobbying for something that'll help them. If you've got a cap, then you're going to want to go to the moon. You know, if, I, if I'm paying 30, 300 sounds good to me, right? The more I can do to push that price up, the better, as long as it's ethical and logical. So, you know, I don't think uncapped notes are, and they're super rare. You have to be in a phenomenal position. Uncapped notes work when you're like Parker Conrad at Rippling and Zenefits, where somebody missed out on the A. And by the way, that's a time when it's relevant. Okay. So I help an entrepreneur raise his A and he's got demand for 30 million and he only wants to take 15, fine. Give the people that missed out the chance to take an uncapped convertible note because they're basically just asking to guarantee their participation in the next round. But for someone coming in at seed, which I think is what we're mainly talking about, like I'm taking the other side of success is absolute total failure and loss of all your money. Right, ben, a question for you. Are you like, seeing that, uh, that there's been a change in market conditions and are you seeing seed investors pulling back because of what you're seeing in the public markets? Danielle made a really great point that the last week, especially the last two, three days, she's seeing people really pulling back. I, yeah. I haven't yet seen that. I mean, it's I'm hearing that it's slowing down. I'm hearing that uh, some of the late stage guys are retrading deals. This is very worrisome. Um, that's a reputation killer. I won't name them because you know I don't have proof. I've just heard it from two different sources. I was talking to some of the folks at one of the big funds that supports me, and I was like, so I assume that with the market having pulled back as much as it has, we assume prices will go down, but entrepreneurs aren't there yet. Like, there's a phase lag. Um, yep. And the answer was, yes, that's generally true, but you know, I will tell you that in general, things are slowing down. So I think people are going to take more time because of the uncertainty. I mean, look, any VC worth their salt wants to believe their company can be public. If you don't think a company has a shot at being public and you're a venture capitalist, you don't understand your job, right? Like investing for SNA is not the answer. I know there are people that do it successfully, but you're not going to be world class. You're not going to be top 10% by investing in some tuck in to Salesforce. And so if you're going to have that mindset, you're going to worry a lot about what the public markets look like because that's the terminus for your investment. You may stay involved, you may continue on with the FOIA style, but net net, that's where you have liquidity and the possibility of, you know, Things moving into uh, you know hey. return. So hey, hey guys, I, I want to. I'm hearing about it. Hey guys, I want. I think to completely switch gears here because uh, Mr. Cricket has asked a question that you know it's a great it's a great one, and I think it's a topic that all of us feel passionate about, which is how do we get more diversity within the the universe of uh, of founders out there? Um, you know, you still hear about uh, women or people of color uh, having trouble raising money. Um, Danielle, I know this is a topic that you're passionate about because you and I have, have talked about it before. You have any thoughts you want to share on this? Um, you know, it's, if anything, uh, I, I, I know it's still hard, um, but in my opinion, it's gotten better um, over, over the last couple of years. Um, I do think that we have moved a focus away from just being, you need to be in Silicon Valley in order to raise. I think there has been uh, 
uh, I mean, I won't say complete flattening, but um, you know, found, investors are, are looking outside of Silicon Valley. They're looking across the country. They're looking globally for for different founders. So I think in terms of access and, and awareness, it's it's better than ever. We're also getting a diversity of fund managers, um, which is great. So that's you the know, key, Daniel. Women, there needs to be more. Yeah, um, there's there's more women. Managers. There's more people of color. Um, you know, uh, more than ever, uh, just creating their own funds. And so they're going out and making an effort to invest in, in other people um, in different diverse sets. So I, I do think it's, I know guys, it's slow. Um, change does not happen overnight, especially not in venture capital, um, but it's it's happening. Um, so have hope that it's, it's it'll, it'll get there. Yeah, I think, you know, as, Louis, as Louis just said, I, I, I think the key to make to this change happening on a sustainable basis is getting investment partners uh, who are diverse. It wasn't that long ago when, you know, all the general all the general partners at venture capital firms, you know, they were all middle aged white guys who went to either Harvard or Stanford Business School, and so that was their view of success was people like them, right? Um, and that's changed a lot in the last five years. Um, there's much more diversity amongst invest investment partners than ever before. And that's not to say that it's happening quickly enough. Um, but mm -hmm. I, I think that I think that it, the needle has moved in the last five years. And I think the needle will move even further in the next five years. Anybody else want to jump in on this topic? Um, I disagree couple, with you, Brett. Oh, go ahead, Ben. Well, I was gonna say a couple of things. You know, I, I do a lot of international and public speaking, and I often get asked this question. And so I launched a site pitch dash ben.com. So anywhere, anybody anywhere in the world could pitch me and I promise them a response uh, to help them calibrate usually. I've made one investment through that vehicle. And this was because, you know, like when you ask people, how do I get to Silicon Valley Venture Capitalist? The answer is find an in, like find a connection. And that's hard. And I don't think that's fair. So I'm like, you know what? You've got a connection. It's a web browser. You can walk into, you can be homeless, go into a library and pitch me if you want. Now, I haven't had anybody that I know to be homeless pitch me, but I've had an incredible diversity of founders from you know, like 62 year old women in Sweden, the African countries all up and down the stack. Um, but I will say this, look, I was inside of a phenomenal firm. You know, I think at the end of the day, Silicon Valley is pretty good at being a meritocracy. I will admit there are one, actually in my memory, there was one partner that was a little too stuck on like where you went to school. Like he didn't understand that, you know, top number one person at the University of Arizona is better than the uh, bottom quartile at Stanford. Like getting into Stanford is hard, but if you don't do anything thereafter, do I care? Like, of, of, you know, there are bottom quartile, bottom 10%. You could be the last person in your class. Should I care about that? I should, because you probably aren't very good at what you do. So I think generally though, it is a meritocracy. So the question was, you know, why do underrepresented founders, blah, 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 even with great traction? I don't agree with that. If you've got great traction, you're going to get funded. Nobody cares what you look like. Right. You can be a purple octopus. In fact, my first name of my venture fund was purple octopus, because I used to always say one day I hope to fund a sentient purple octopus to prove to the world it doesn't matter. You go from one to six million in a year. You know, I do not care. You could be a talking dog. Uh, and I think sometimes <laughs> people just fundamentally misunderstand what traction means. Specifically, three, four, five years ago, when people said to me, as they always do, what do I need to do to raise a series of? And I'd say, hey, SaaS business, you know, if you can get from zero to a million dollars of revenue in 12 to 18 months, you should be good to go. That ain't true anymore. Series A's are going off at two to three million dollars of initial revenue. So if you think your hundred grand of revenue is tracking, you're wrong. Nobody cares. Get me to two, two point two three. The last Series A I did, 2.2 .2 million of revenue created over by a female founder after one year, $60 million valuation. Nobody was looking at her going like, oh, it's a female founder. Like, now, here's the thing. If that female founder came in with $220,000 worth of traction, nobody would have cared about it. Ben, I'm going I'm to go to make a point, which I think it, it goes to bridges what you're saying with what, what Brett's saying. And that's that um, I think that you've got to be going after, you've got to have a segment of fund managers that are going after the market segments that are serving these populations. And so Monique Woodward, a good friend of mine, ex-500 investor, has launched her own fund called Cake Ventures. And her investment theses is going after you know communities that that are, are unique 
uh, whether they're aging or uh, women or minorities that are looking for specific products. And she's going and finding the entrepreneurs that are making products for those people. Um, and and I, so I think that it's not just having uh, uh, people of color going into mainstream funds. It's that it's that pools of capital are going after markets where those people are and live. Yeah. And you you mentioned <laughs> Gangels, too. I mean, that's that's part of their whole thesis as well. Um, See, you know, I, find it, I find Gangels invest in anything. It, they're, they're not investing really only for 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 businesses operated by uh, people of that community. It's it's just getting exposure to the capital for that community. Um, I mean, they're they claim to be investing in. You have to have you know you have to be you have to have part of your mission to have a diverse team and that can mean a bunch of different things so in that they're looking for for people who you know are, are trying to build diversity into it um backstage capital i also think is is working towards this as well i mean there's there's right. people who have it as part of their mission statement their their theses to to go after these groups um to to give them more you know to give them more accessibility awareness um things like that so there, there are definitely funds out there. Um, and for people who think they can't find them, I, honestly, that's on you. Um, you need to you need to do the work. Um, there are so many lists out there, Crunchbase. Um, they're all speaking. They're all getting out there because they need the awareness too. So if really you're having a hard trouble finding them, that's, that's kind of on you. I have a friend who started a fund uh, called Women's women's venture capital fund, I think it is, um, just to focus on female founded companies. And in the investment thesis really is just simply that there's plenty of evidence that women are better managing money than men are. <laughs> so, you know, at least it's, so it's rooted in a very, very simple, valid investment thesis. So Chris, um, I feel like uh, we have not brought you into this conversation very well. Um, so, Chris, I think here's the question for you: Is that um, a lot of people on this uh, on this call today are founders who are planning to raise seed money in 2022? So, given the fact that you just successfully raised a two and a half billion dollar round of seed money in 2021, what advice would you give? You know, if somebody came to you today and said, "Hey, I'm I'm a founder. I'm about to hit the fundraising trail for a seed round," what advice would you give them? That's a great question. Um, I think a lot of people kind of overcomplicate this and optimize for things that aren't important. And what kind of Ben said is, it's just about growth, right? Like if you show you're growing at a rate faster than every other startup, startup, it doesn't matter, you know, what terms you're going for, what other things you're optimizing for. Like that's what people care about. Um, I think a lot of founders like over fixate on fundraising and waste a lot of time on it. And like this is really really mm -hmm. important. Don't get me wrong, but the biggest thing you can do to help your company is just like focus, like put your head down and just. For as much as possible, and like fundraising is a side quest. Like some people love to fundraise and like really uh, excited to talk to VCs, and like that's great if that's you. But if you're really going to build a big company, it's just getting fundraising down and getting back to work. And I think like I've had the problem of getting too excited about fundraising and like getting distracted by these big name VCs and like listen to podcasts about this and like even like like conversations like this. Like this is a great conversation to listen to if you're a founder, but don't don't spend more than you know an hour a week some of the stuff like this because at the end of the day you should be just growing your startup and like putting your head down it's gonna happen yeah and this by the way is, is is also a good argument for uh, for the high resolution seed finance methodology meaning use safes because they are super lightweight documents that can be mm -hmm. executed and closed upon really quickly um because you know as chris kind of alluded um you know, building a startup is, is is hard work. And you don't want to be spending all your time fundraising. You want to be spending your time getting customers, making customers happy, figuring out what customers care about, right? That's, mm -hmm. as for you as a startup founder, that's where you want your time to be focused. And it's very easy for startup, it's very easy for fundraising to become your full-time job. Yeah. Very easy for fundraising to become your full-time job. And if that's your full-time job, then you're not spending any time taking care of customers. <laughs> and so using safes, which are super lightweight agreements that are easy to execute and close upon quickly is part of it. And then also, you know, the, um, you know, one of the ways in which I see this high resolution fundraising process used pretty effectively 
is that um, so in terms of convincing investors to join, social proof is huge, right? You can spend you can spend months and months and months pitching, trying to get somebody to say yes, and instead you get a whole bunch of maybes. And I always say that as a startup founder, maybe is the worst answer you can possibly get. Because a yes you know to do with, a no you know to do with, but a maybe you have no idea what to do with. <laughs> and so you got a whole bunch of maybes. And then all of a sudden, Danielle decides to invest. And now you can circle back with the others and you can say, you know, well, Danielle's in. And all of a sudden, that was the moment you were waiting for where your deal now has social proof and they're all willing to to join the round. That's that's the way it works, for better or for worse. And so with by using the high resolution fundraising methodology, you can go to a couple of highly influential investors, people who will really, if they're in on the deal, it'll carry a lot of weight. It'll provide a lot of social proof to others. And go to them and say, you know what, how about if you toss in $10,000 at a $500,000 valuation cap? So in other words, a, a deal that's too good to say no to. And if those two highly influential investors say, all right, fine, I'll do that, then that can provide tremendous social proof that'll help you fill out the round. Yeah. Um, I want to Chris, you agree with that? A little bit in the spirit of a fun battle. Um, Great. Uh, I can see how somebody that's super influential in your category that could work with. I don't know if, but two things. One, if they're investing ten thousand dollars, like it's hard for me to comprehend that they're an influential investor. <laughs> right. Two, like if you're going after truly what I consider influential investors, the seed stage, tier one uh, folks that I consider my, you know, whatever competitors, colleagues, right. first round capital, floodgate, a um, couple of others, Harrison Metal, they're going to insist on an equity round, right? They're going to put in real money. They're not going to care who follows. You know, I will tell you, I learned the hard way. I once did a deal that I wasn't convinced of because of an investor. I thought, well, if they're in, I should be. But I didn't know the backstory. That investor was in for all the wrong reasons. I should have trusted my gut. I lost all my money on the deal. And I always remember it. I hate that people care so much. Now, in fairness, you know, like the $10,000 person, this is why YC works. They got a whole bunch of these randos that don't know dick that are going to be there. They're going to throw in their little tiny checks and that are going to be influenced by whoever's doing it. They're going to think some movie star or football player matters when it's highly likely right. they don't. You know, like, right. oh, they're going to show up. I had some uh, uh, movie stars that wanted to get into a SPV I was doing, and they're like, but well, we need special terms. We don't want to pay. I'm like, so so I should give it to you for free? Why? We're going to add value. What? You're going to write up, you're going to have a movie about my company? You know, like, what is the value you're going to deliver? I mean, a lot of this harkens back, not to go off on a rant, but, uh, you know, what's his name? Two and a half men claiming that he's the one that made Twitter. But net net, I think you need to do a round that is, so you are super busy. I agree with that. But you're not going to be less busy later. So deal with it. Mm -hmm. now. Like, yeah. act like a big boy or girl and do a real round. And, you know, like, understand that safes are, in my opinion, for amateurs. Look, you know, plenty of real people do them, but what that means is they're not willing to have a hard conversation. So you're just deferring a hard conversation, and it's going to be harder later. Do it right. right you're kicking now. the kicking the can down the road with regard to valuation. Right. No, so, so Kapil, just quickly a similar point here, which is they had a lot of value added, um, you know, strategics that wanted in, and they thought that it would be harder for them to follow an equity round than a safe, and they'd already told them it was a safe. So I was like, okay, fine. I don't want to upset the Apple card. You got like a million bucks from random, but high quality strategic investors. Let's leave it be. But I still am not in love with the fact that I did that. I should have worked harder. I, I should have made them do it the right way. Um, anyway, sorry, I'll shut up on that. But I'm, I'm a much better yeah, that's good. It's good. So, so uh, Cap Capel asks a really good question, which is that kind of we, we all get the the fact that um, you know having traction. Uh, is the best way to convince investors that you're onto something, right? That, you know, I always say that what an investor really wants is proof of market demand. And so, you know, getting 100,000 customers in the first six months is pretty damn good proof of market demand. But Capital asks a question about, you know, the reality is a lot of people need funding even earlier than that. A lot of people need some funding to get from the idea stage to having some traction. So, you know, what's your recommendation on, 
on that. So, Chris, you for you it was you did a friends and family round, right? So, before you had any traction, when it was just you know Chris's good looking face and and a and an awesome idea, you were able to find friends and family who were willing to kind of make that leap of faith. Is that accurate, Chris? I mean, for us, to be honest, we went from idea to revenue in four days because we just show off. And I'm show not, I'm not off. trying to show off. Like, you know, I'm not trying to show off. I'm just trying to say that uh, we always fundraise by traction. And so, like, I don't want to yeah. give okay. advice, advice here. But I think the point to make here is that, like, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to have a finished product to have traction. Like, we were having traction off of a Google form, right? And we were delivering right. out of our own cars in, like, my kitchen. So I think that like traction means a lot of different things and it's easy to get, you know, feel like traction used to be this crazy thing that you need six months of, you, need, you know, $500,000 to get, you know. Chris, how much, how much customer discovery did you do before you got your traction? None. None. Yeah. Love it. No customer discovery? You didn't talk to any customers? Like, I mean, the talking to customers was, was sending out this Google form. Because it was, was selling them, right? Yeah, I was selling them. And then Nails we talked to them by Sorry. delivering to them ourselves and being like, hey, why did you order from us? What do you like about it? And I mean, then like the reason we didn't have to do customer discovery, we chose not to, is because it took maybe two hours to launch this in just the simplest possible version. So like our customer discovery was through traction and through actually getting the sale. Yeah. Okay. You are rare. I think this, I think this <laughs> illustrates. <laughs> yes. But, but it also, I think, Danielle, I think it illustrates the fact that one of the great things about being an entrepreneur in 2022 is that the tools available today to be able to do stuff like this are amazingly powerful and amazingly inexpensive. That, um, uh, you know, to, to the things that it used to be you would have to hire a market research firm for $100,000 to find out whether people prefer chocolate chip cookies or peanut butter cookies. You know, today you spend 50 bucks on some Facebook ads and see which ad gets the most clicks, right? So, um, you know, today you can you can get a lot of market information. You can gain a lot of insights about customers in, a way, in ways that are incredibly cheap and, and easy. So a friend of mine who... Uh, is, is a form of discovery. I'm going to drop off because we're over time and I've got another commitment, but I want to quickly make one point. Awesome. Which is, so, yes, yeah. traction is the best possible thing. But sometimes you don't need it if your vision is so huge, and I believe that you can get there. You know, we were talking about underrepresented founders. I remember when a, 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 a young black kid, uh, I assume that's a close correct term these days, came into any eight of pitch a business called Play Versus. He'd literally grown up in the ghetto, had uh, you know, like had to struggle with avoiding dealing with the drug dealers, and started a cell phone company. Like worked his way. I mean, couldn't have been a better like fight through the hardship kind of guy. And he had locked up the exclusive. So he was doing Play Versus is an esports company that lets high school students get credit and letter in esports, right? But he had fought really hard. He had no revenue yet, but he had locked up an agreement with whatever that organization is that regulates like college basketball and all that stuff, high school stuff. And now he was the official and exclusive provider of that offering. That contract that he was able to get with no revenue attached to it, just an opportunity, was enough to show us a huge opportunity. And we funded him. A lot of other people funded him. He's done really, really well. He's an awesome, tenacious entrepreneur. And it's just an example where, I mean, I guess in theory, the traction was that he signed the contract, but he had no revenue yet. And and here's the last thing I'll say. I, I created this thing I call the Ben Rule. People just misunderstand what venture capital is about. Think about your ultimate outcome. If one-fifth of your ultimate outcome is not 50%, of the size of the fund you're pitching, you shouldn't be pitching that fund. I need to believe that you are a future public company with uncapped upside and a $5 billion market cap early in your career, or I do not have any interest in funding you. And that's not because you're not going to build something cool. It's just because it doesn't match my needs. And uh, you, know, you might be able to explain why the 20% and the 50% makes sense. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, sorry. Thanks, Ben. Okay, so um, I think it's time for us to wrap up. This has been a great discussion. So, you know, I was thinking about how a, f a friend of mine who's been a venture capitalist for a long time, he says that, you know, what he's really looking for is, is a just add money opportunity. In other words, he's looking for opportunities where the entrepreneur has already kind of done the hard work uh, and now we just add money and boom, it takes off. And of course, nothing is ever quite that simple. Um, but, um, you know, as Chris 
said, using things like, you know, simple forms and Facebook ads and stuff, you can, you can get enough early indication of traction uh, that, you know, this looks like something that's got legs. This looks like something that, you know, adds some money and this, and this thing may take off. Um, and as I said before, the, one of the great things about being an entrepreneur in 2022 is that these tools are readily available and incredibly powerful. So find some, find some ways of showing traction, find some ways of proving market demand. Uh, and that'll be, those are your best talking points, talking to investors. Louis, you want to wrap us up here? Um, I just wanted to thank our, our awesome, uh, panelists who come from the real world. Uh, Chris, who's just done this uh, as an entrepreneur, right on, man. Uh, thank you so much for sharing the feedback of what you found uh, it, while you were out in the jungle. Um, Danielle, it's always it's always an honor and a pleasure to, to connect with you and get your, um, your perspectives. And uh, you heard it first from Danielle. There is uh, perhaps some, some softening in the market that we should all be uh, out, keep our eyes out for. And, and, and Brett, thank you so much for putting this together. Uh, we'll, we'll put it on us next time. I love this live stream platform. And we're going to do this again uh, on a different topic. Uh, we're going to talk about bad blood and due diligence, I think, next one. Uh, oh, as, as the, Elis said, the Elizabeth Holm happening. story. Yeah, there's not much diligence yeah. happening out there in, in seed, seed land. And, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about some small things you can do to uh, be careful and still go fast in high resolution. Brett, thanks awesome. again. Awesome. Thanks to you all. See you soon.